So I'm really happy to introduce our seminar speaker today, Dr. Mary Ruckelshaus. Uh, Mary is currently a consulting professor at Stanford University in the Woods Institute of the Environment, and she's also the director of a really interesting project, the Natural Capital Project, and I think she'll tell us a little bit about that both today and tomorrow. Uh, she has a, brings a very diverse background to her work. Her undergraduate degree was in human biology at Stanford, and she has a master's in fisheries and a PhD in botany, both from University of Washington. Uh, she started her career as a, a standard academic at Florida State University and did research in marine ecosystems there. But after a three or four years, she moved to NOAA Fisheries as a federal scientist at a time when uh, NOAA was uh, doing some really innovative science uh, to develop especially plans for salmon recovery. So the Pacific Northwest is now uh, famous for having many, many, many ESA-listed stocks. And Mary was part of a group that put together uh, the scientific framework to begin to act on uh, recovering those stocks. And I think it was really... Uh, path-breaking work, really elegant work. Uh, there's a paper from about 2000 that was a NOAA technical document. It's widely read, it's available on the web on viable salmonid populations, which uh, took a lot of basic science and distilled it down to an actionable framework for evaluating uh, what could recover stocks. Uh, she also has worked a lot at ecosystem level management in general, and she moved from NOAA to the Natural Capital Project, what, about three years ago? five years ago, at the beginning of that. So um, I'm really, really pleased that Mary's here to talk to us about that. She's been a real leader in uh, putting science at the interface with society into a framework that uh, could be that could work. Uh, she's been a leader both in developing conceptual frameworks and models and also in creating what we now call boundary organ, uh, organizations, so uh, partnerships in which people that represent uh, many interested parties, including science, uh, figure out how to get together and take care of uh, environmental actions. So tonight, the topic of Mary's talk is nature of by and for the people. and thank you for inviting me here. It's really been great to meet many of you already, and I look forward to talking with more of you as the next day and a half go on. Um, yeah, so as Nancy said, I'm, I'm a marine population biologist, but my passion is really to a answer innovative, um, challenging new science questions by first talking to the people who I hope will use the answer. So um, that's what I started doing at NOAA, and that's what I do now. And so I'll talk today about um, how the conservation biology field and conservation science in general is being changed because of the way that conservation practitioners in NGOs and governments and even corporations are changing the way they think. So um, this title comes from a biography of Lincoln I just read, and I'll get, get to that in a second. So most of us know the narrative pretty well. That's kind of what I call the old narrative from the environmental movement. And that's, oh my gosh, look how much light from human activity we can see from space. And look at the terrible destruction that's happening around the world due to human activity. So it, a lot of conservation practice and science has focused on really evaluating, quantifying, mapping and hand-wringing about these impacts of human activities on the environment. And it's all true, and we have to pay attention, and it's really important that we not forget this. It doesn't always lead to figuring out ways to solve these problems that our activities are causing. One of the very common and, again, older approaches of the conservation movement has been to put fences up and to keep people out and try to protect lands and waters and parts of the ocean so that people's impacts would be lessened. And as we know, that's, that's been only partly successful over the years, and it's getting harder as land and waters become under higher demand. So this, this tension we're feeling right now is leading to lots of fighting. And I don't know how much of this you're exposed to, but in my world, between 
conservation science in the in universities and in practice in the NGOs, it's pretty vitriolic right now. Even inside the big NGOs, there are huge divisions. Some say, uh, this is Peter Kariva, for those of you guys who don't know him, he's the lead scientist for the Nature Conservancy, that it's really not a good idea and not productive. It's actually counterproductive to try to focus on how we can just preserve little remnant islands of the Holocene um, in this new world of the Anthropocene where human activities are really driving much of the change. Others like Johan Rockström at the Stockholm Resilience Center are thinking more about limits to planetary boundaries and how do we provide life support systems without tipping into a new undesirable state. There's a really interesting book, if you haven't read it, by Emma Maris called The Rambunctious Garden, which is sort of saying, actually, nature's pretty resilient, and maybe we should be thinking about all the spaces in between the protected areas or the downtown urban areas, and think about all the benefits that we get from nature in between, and she calls that the rambunctious garden. So there's, there's a, a big um, tension going on in the conservation practice community, and it's being reflected in the science that I see. And on top of all that is this incredibly smart young group of next generation people coming forward, and some of you in this room might be in these categories, that do not self-identify as environmentalists, and in some cases they actually um, are pushing themselves away from them. DNC did this great poll of teenagers. They surveyed 3,000 teenagers, this was two years ago, and they asked them a whole bunch of questions, one of which was, what do you think of when you think of an environmentalist? And the, the really common gist of the answers that the, the pollsters summarized was a blonde woman who's preachy and not much fun. <laughs> so that, that is the image that this next generation has of environmentalists, and that's not great. So we have a problem not only of internecine battles in the conservation practice world, but also this next generation of people who are going to have to do something about the state we're in, not really wanting to associate with conservations or environmentalism. So I'd say that the conservation science and conservation practice are having a bit of an identity crisis right now. And what we can all agree on is what we're, what we're losing. And often we don't actually know and appreciate what we've lost until it's gone. So I think this sense of urgency everybody feels and what, what is not happening yet is what to do about it. So this is where this biography came in. This is, um, uh, I've read lots of different biographies of Lincoln. This one really hit me. And it, the, you know, the Gettysburg Address was only two minutes long. And it was two years into the war. And then the war didn't end for two years after that. But, but it, it, think about the incredible impact it has. And the crux of Lincoln's argument was, of course, he was talking about government. But he was saying that government of, by, and for the people shall not perish from this earth. And obviously he was right. He was a visionary in many ways. But I, it got me thinking that this is actually a really good construct for what the conservation science and, and practitioners really need to think about these days. And maybe if we think about a broader view of how people interact with nature, so we affect we affect nature by our activities, so this whole sort of old school approach is still absolutely critical, that the cumulative effects of our actions, we need to understand them so we can reduce those. But we don't tend to think so much about these other two ways that people interact with nature. And one is that we change and transform fundamentally landscapes and the ocean. And by changing them, we create working and managed lands and waters. And there's a lot of benefit or impact that those can have on life support systems. So we could be paying a lot more attention to how we change the lands through our actions and waters. And then this last one is what I'll spend most of the time on this afternoon. And that's for the people. So if we think also not only about how nature is affected by our actions and the ways that we've been changing landscapes and waters, but also 
instead of thinking about how to save nature, what if we asked ourselves, how does nature save us? What do we get from it? And use that in more arguments about why it's really important to think about what we're doing to it. So that's kind of the crux of what Lincoln helped me see that I'll walk through now um, in the rest of this talk. OK, so of the people, this is what we all hear about a lot. And it's again, it's really important. But these are really important drivers that we are pretty well understanding. Um, a lot of good science to be done. But we've got 7 billion people approaching that on the globe. And not only the population, as we know, the, the trend globally is actually flattening out. But it's the change in consumption, the shifts in the diets and the livelihoods that's really going to drive a lot more impacts in these areas. So human, you know, nature of the people is um, something we really have to keep paying attention to. Consumption, there's, a, there's an artist named Chris Jordan. I don't know if you guys have seen his work. He does these really interesting micro photos to show visually what consumption really looks like. And he, this is one he did about um, supermarket bags in the US each hour. And 1.41, 1 a little bit over 1 million paper bags are used in the US each hour. And then he wraps that up and makes it look like a beautiful birch forest. So consumption is huge, and we've got to get a handle on that. So this by the people part is this is where the rambunctious garden and some of the, the new conservation arguments come in. The idea here is that a very small fraction of the land on Earth is in protected status. TNC did an atlas on this um, a couple of years ago, 13%. And a vanishingly small percentage of the oceans is in protected status. That's where a lot of the conservation science and practice has been focused over the last 30 years. What if instead we thought about the matrix of working lands, the 87% of the Earth that is not in protected status, or the 99.9% .9 of the oceans? What could we get if we think about those areas in these conservation strategies or how we frame the science? So that's, that's the, the way to think about these working landscapes. I know a lot of you in this room have been doing this for quite a while. The West in the US, I think, is way ahead on this. And farming in the ocean. So three years ago, protein sources from the sea now have come, a majority of them come from farmed sources rather than wild caught. That just flipped um, about three years ago. So now more of what we get from protein from the ocean is coming from farms. And that's increasing. So those trends are going to increase. That obviously has a huge impact on that environment. So these two, that's all I'm going to say. There's, there's lots of work being done and more to be done. I think some of this is really just how we talk about it. But I want to focus the rest of my time on this for the people and how we can talk about that and what we're learning about the science so far. So the idea here are these concepts that have this terrible term for those of you who aren't steeped in the academic literature. And they're called ecosystem services. The, the, what they really are the benefits that humans get from nature. And they're very broad. And they're, you know, come, some of them listed here, but it's things that, that are, we directly benefit, like we eat stuff out of nature, but also things like um, supporting services, um, like energy, and also livelihoods and really derived services. So they're very broad. And if we incorporate more of these into the science and the discussion for making a case for why. We should be thinking more about nature and how we incorporate it into our planning and management. I think we can go a lot farther than we have today. So just one little example. There's, there's really good academic science on many of those ecosystem services, where they occur and what their magnitude is under different conditions. So we all know this, but we've learned more and more about the details of how Coastal habitats protect people from storms and sea level rise. And we can now distinguish mangroves from marshes, from coastal forests, and even say under what storm conditions and what height of the, of the wave and at what frequency. And given these conditions of a healthy marsh or a degraded marsh, how much of the wave coming ashore will be attenuated. And therefore, how much flooding and flooding damage might accrue to people there. So we know pretty much we're learning a lot about these different sciences. 
And we also now are, are getting a lot of information from social scientists talking about the unequal distribution of these impacts. So people along coastlines, there's more and more people moving there. Many of them are vulnerable to coastal storms and sea level rise, which we know are both increasing under climate. And that the, dis the poor are disproportionately affected by these storms. This is just a picture of Katrina, but it's playing out all over the world. So there's, there's good biophysical science from engineering and ecology and good social science that's really documenting how changes in these coastal habitats are changing directly human well-being. And there's also the idea that biodiversity actually is part of this ecosystem service or net natural capital or nature's benefit construct. So by, there's been a really interesting review a couple years ago in Nature looking at how biodiversity relates to these benefits that, it's, that nature provides. I was talking with somebody today. It's definitely true that if you're focused on one species, like a charismatic species like a sage grouse, that it may not be that the places that you should protect for the sage grouse are going to be the same as the places you should protect if you want to maximize water retention or nutrient filtration. So there's not always a one-to-one -one correlation between saving biodiversity, so to speak, and saving ecosystem services. But they're now understanding a lot better how they relate. So because biodiversity underpins the way ecosystems function, they were able to really look at these correlations and describe well. If you want to use biodiversity as a correlate for some functions, you can do it with some confidence. It's interesting, using biodiversity as a correlate for services is really mixed. It's very kind of dangerous is the way I took this. Some correlations are positive, things like crops and um, fishery and timber yields, that makes sense. But um, other things are not. They're either not so, they're not correlated or there's actually a negative correlations, for example, with disease regulation. So it's just showing you that the arguments that the conservation community is having about are we trying to protect biodiversity or are we trying to protect services, there's something real in there that if your objectives are one or the other, they're not always going to completely overlap. It's important to remember that. And without this science, we wouldn't have really been able to tell that. There's also a lot of good work on how do you value these benefits. So some people, when they hear ecosystem services or valuing nature, they immediately assume that means let's put a dollar value on it and oh, I have a problem with that because I can think of my favorite nature's benefit like a sacred place or a species like a sage grouse and how would you ever put a price on that? And that's true and we actually hear that from a lot of people that we work with. A lot of things can be monetized um, and you can quibble about the methods and that's what's the fun academic side of this. There are also other metrics that people care a lot about, which is how many people are displaced or in harm's way if nature shield like a mangrove forest or a wetland is lost. So during Katrina, when people were migrating away from the coast because of danger, how many people are displaced? That metric of number of people is a really important value metric. Some of them obviously are priceless. They don't want to put any cost on it at all. Others, there are this whole field of cultural services that people are developing now that are trying to work out how, to, how do you really represent the mental health benefits and the physical health benefits of nature exposure. So just as an example, this is a paper that came out of an NC's working group um, a couple years ago. This just shows in pictorial ways, it's a really interesting review, it shows the many different ways that humans interact with nature and what do we know about the, be the benefits of that or if there is no effect. So these are just the, the non-really non-material, non-direct consumption sort of ways of interacting with nature. And there's a, a very wide swath of I impacts that nature has on people that we're starting to better understand. And if you want to read more about it, go read Rolly Russell's paper. It's really interesting. There is a whole field that has arisen that's called happiness studies. There's a journal of happiness studies. There's a huge database that the last time I saw it had 100,000 
um, actual just geo-referenced points, and then mostly these studies are self-described happiness. So it's a it's a it's a way that people just do surveys. It's very well tested and repeatable, and they just ask you how happy are you right now on average, and they give you a one through five scale. So there's a very very big database on um, happiness that you can now relate to lots of different attributes of the environment. So there's lots and lots of burgeoning research in how do people's mental health relate to the environment, starting with these big global databases. Many of you may have heard of the king of Bhutan's gross, gross happiness index. He started this, and now they measure it like GDP in Bhutan. And, and the UK is doing this now more and more places are starting to measure mental health indices as well as the gross um, domestic product kind of indices. And here's one example. This is a Gallup poll they've been doing for at least five years now. And they ask people almost every single day of the year, and it's just one of these self-described happiness um, questionnaires. And you can see it looks kind of like an EKG. This is, um, I think this is King County where, where I live in Seattle, which always is pretty high. But it's all over the place. They do this all over the world. And you can, you can now take these data and relate them to things that are happening around people in their neighborhoods and what kind of experiences they're having. You might have seen those cell phone apps people are using more and more now to get real-time data. There's just a, a really exploding um, area of research here that's, that can be applied now. This is, so this is where I'm going with these examples. I'm just going to give you a few more. What I'm motivated to do is to take the information that's, that's growing in the academic community and get it put into practice. Because there's a lot of great stories and narratives that are coming out of science in academia, and it's not being applied. So other interesting, just along the lines of these mental health impacts of nature. There's really good growing data more and more. We have two graduate students working on this at Stanford with us right now. How very short exposures to nature can improve motor coordination, also attention capacity, and cognitive function. So just kids going to a park and walking in a suburban area relative to a downtown area, you can, you can see measurable differences. This is an older study that's pretty well known, but people do heal faster even when you're looking out a window in a hospital room at nature. So this was a treatment where people looked at a brick wall in some beds, and then others looked outside at trees. And they had these, these responses. And the, my favorite was fewer negative comments in the nurse's notes, because as we all know, that greatly affects what kind of care you get if your nurses aren't mad at you. But there are very measurable differences in rates of healing if you're even looking out of a window at nature. And I think this is the last one. This is an old study also done by Khan at University of Washington where he exposed people again to a window looking at trees, a plasma screen looking at something similar to what they were looking out the window, and then a brick wall. And then was looking at productivity measures, so how quickly could you do tasks that he had given them um, as a baseline. And the answer was a real window looking at nature really had higher productivity scores, but the plasma screen and the brick wall were the same. So you can tell your, your friends or kids that too. OK, so that, that's just a little very light sampling of these, these growing scientific advances that are in academia. And what I'd like to just tell you in the last um, sort of third of my, the last, it sounds like the car talk guys, the second third of the show. Um, the last part of my talk is what we're doing in my group called the Natural Capital Project to try to get that science from academia out into practice. And also, what we do is find incredibly interesting science questions that come from talking to decision makers. So it's really a two-way um, discourse that's going on. So what we do is we incorporate nature's benefits into decisions. And we're doing that um, in a lot of different ways that I'll tell you about. So what we're taking this old paradigm of people n negatively impacting the environment, which as we talked about before, we do. 
and flipping it by using these concepts of ecosystem services or nature's benefits to think instead about how our actions affect the environment, but also how the environment in turn affects us. And what we're finding in working with lots of decision makers in a lot of places is that this framing makes you do really different science and it makes people take really different kinds of decisions because their whole perspective changes. As you can notice, it helps you think of ways to design strategies that are very different than just reducing impacts of our activities on the environment. So here's kind of the crux of what the Natural Capital Project does. So we, you know, we all know the, that people's lives and livelihoods depend on nature. And so our premise is that if you can understand where and when nature matters most, then that's going to improve decisions. And we are an interesting partnership. So we're two universities, Stanford and the University of Minnesota. This is Steve Pulaski's group. And then two NGOs, the Nature Conservancy and World Wildlife Fund. So the idea is that the NGOs bring field problems and on the ground challenges they're having in trying to get people to think differently about restoration or spatial planning or investments they're making in infrastructure. And they come to the universities and say, can you help us bring some cutting edge science into those, those projects? And as I mentioned, I think when we started this about seven years ago, this partnership, we thought it was mainly going to be getting science out into the field, into practice. And I underestimated how much talking to the people in the field was going to change the science and transform it. So it's really much more two-way than I thought it would be. So we have three real uh, um, things that we do. We do new science that we co-develop with these decision makers. I'll show you a couple of examples. And we build what we are trying to call a body of evidence that it's not that hard to include these nature's benefits in decisions. It's, it's pretty straightforward. You can do it in fancy ways or very simple ways. And it can actually really fundamentally change decisions. And then we have tools that we build that are software tools that we use to educate people and build capacity around the world. So our approach has been pretty scientific. <laughs> we picked lots of different decision contexts in our first five years um, on purpose and in lots of different places. So very different biophysical settings and very different decision-making groups. Some of them are governments, some of them are private companies, some of them are NGOs, some of them are stakeholder groups that have all of the above with them, and asking really different things like climate adaptation planning or how to do permitting and development assessment um, or how to do spatial planning, and then now we're getting into corporate risk management. So we figured if we sampled a wide swath of decision contexts where everybody had the common notion to come to us and say, yeah, I want to do ecosystem services. I want to do natural capital and include it in my work. That's the only thing they knew when they come to us. So we have a big discussion about what does that mean and what do you need and what do we have and what should we change. So we've really sampled a wide, a wide variety of places and decision contexts in trying to develop these simple approaches. So the first example I'll show you, I'm just going to give you, I think, three examples. Um, the first one is some spatial planning that we've done in Belize with the government. So they wanted to take their whole coastline and say, where should development be allowed? And where should we maintain relatively protected areas because tourism is their number one um, economic um, source of um, revenue for the country. So they wanted to really find a balance between development and tourism um, in, in Belize. So the main things then, what we did is translate that into our science speak. And so for us, that means we have to know where the habitats are because these habitats, mangroves, coral reefs, and seagrasses, are the basis for all of these services they care about. They care about lobster and conch fisheries for subsistence and commercial value. They care a lot about where the reefs are protecting their shorelines because if the beaches erode, then so do the hotels and so does most of their tourism dollars, which as I said is their biggest 
um, economic sector. So these are the three services that they asked us to quantify and map for them under different scenarios of development. And we knew to do these, we had to map the habitats as well. And then this, just to give you a flavor, these are all the activities that they want to keep doing. And this is pretty common. If you look at this list, this is what most countries want to allow their citizens to do. So this is where I think this new conservation approach is really helpful, is that you're not trying to just do one thing at a time, like find where all the reserves should go for conservation, which if that comes up against other goals like coastal development or aquaculture, conservation typically loses out. So thinking about all of these together is hard, but you can do it in scenarios, which is the way we do it. And then you can look at the trade-offs and show them where the, how the benefits change under different combinations of these activities in very explicit places. So it's very spatial in this um, exercise. And the other thing that was interesting, some of us were talking about this today, they, they wanted dollar values for some of these benefits, just because it helped them talk to the tourism ministry and developers. But for many of them, they just wanted these kind of more biophysical units. They know what their spiny lobster landings have been over time, and they just want to make sure they're stable or increasing in some regions if they're decreasing in others. They already keep track of visitors per day for tourism, and so that was the currency they wanted to use. So I'm just indicating here that the value currencies that they're interested in are really different. Some of it's dollars and some of it's these other ones. And then all the models that we have in our toolbox all have this core simple um, statement here. This is called an ecological production function for those of you who know the literature. It's basically saying if you change an ecosystem so the habitats or the functions they provide, how does that change the services that, that people can derive from it? And then how does that change the value or the benefits of those services to people? So this is written in a sentence what is in the equations of all the service models that we pr produce. And some of these, this is a, an example in Belize where we didn't have all the models that we needed. So their question that seems really simple about coral reefs and mangroves, and if I lose them to development, what will that do to my erosion risk on the shore? There were no models to estimate that. So there were really good physics models just looking at flooding risk, um, very good coastal, coastal engineering models to look at that. But no models that had biological habitats in them that if you changed them, if you changed where a coral reef was or seagrasses or mangroves, how would that change the flood risk? Those models didn't exist. So this is an example of a decision-making group we're working with driving new science. So we built some new coastal protection models that are now published and that other people are using in other places. But it helped us answer the question where along the Belizean shoreline, if they lost seagrasses or mangroves to development, would their erosion risks be much, much higher? And where would it not matter so much? Another example, and I'll talk more about these tomorrow in the science talk, um, that we couldn't really do very well was the recreation value. So recreation value is a hugely important um, estimate for governments around the world. This is tourism is really a big, um, a big piece of economies in a lot of developing countries. But if, if you know how this goes, most recreation models are based on visitor counts. So people at national parks, we have great visitor counts. But in many, many places around the world and on the Belizean reefs where people like to go scuba diving, there are no people counting how many visitors have come here. So Spencer Wood and our group figured out this really interesting way to use social media to crowdsource, essentially, estimates of how many people are going to different places using Flickr data. So we now have a method, and he's, he's tested it against real counts, so we, we know the confidence in it, of using 
basically, a, you know, a social media source like where people post a picture of a place and what is the density of those pictures and how many people have posted them as a way to estimate visitors to different places. And then you can use that to estimate the different values people place on different habitats with different conditions. So it's another example of a question that came from the Belizean government that drove new science. And this, this approach is taking off in some interesting ways I can talk a little bit more about tomorrow. OK, so that was just a little taste of Belize. I'm just going to show you two or three more dots on that map with all the dots of where we've worked to show you some different decision contexts. And I'm not going to give you any of the science behind these. I'm just going to just give you a quick indication of how diverse the questions that we're getting from people are. So one of them is in these, these um, mostly in Latin America is where this started. The Catskills in New York City water supply was actually the first example. These are these payment schemes. They're called payments for ecosystem services, where downstream users, it could be big agricultural producers, and cities, so city water supplies, the utilities, pay upstream users to either change their practices, change how they're farming or ranching or logging, or to buy land and protect it if the water retention here is so critical that for the water supply downstream that you really don't want anyone to do anything with the land. So these are well established. They're called water funds. These cities and downstream users, typically companies, so it's a public-private partnership downstream, will say, I have $10 million to invest in the next two years in activities in the upper watershed that I've penciled out and decided that's better investment of $10 million to put money up here in vegetation rather than putting in a water treatment plant. So they did the economics. But then the question is, in what activities should they be investing and where? So should they pay farmers to put up fences to keep cows out of the streams? Should they change the way they plant trees along the riparian zone? Or should they change the way people grow sugarcane? Those are all different examples of the kinds of investments that that fund could do. But they want to know which ones are likely to give me the biggest returns for clean water. And where in the watershed should I invest that money? So we've been doing this with landowners and these secretariats with the water funds in Latin America for five years now and have developed some really interesting um, science that they're now applying and testing in interesting ways. OK, completely different decision maker and different question. So through the Nature Conservancy, they have a big partnership with Dow Chemical. It's a six-year, $10 million partnership to try to get more natural capital investments into Dow's business planning. So they asked us to come in and help them with some of these really basic questions. For one of their places, this is the biggest Dow chemical producer um, in the world, um, and it's in Freeport, Texas. So what they wanted to know is, what's the potential role of natural capital in three things about their big plant in Freeport? One is. How do they protect this physical plant from sea level rise? Should they put in more seawalls, or could they use the marshes and mangroves um, and forests outside this plant to help them in a more sustainable way protect it from sea level rise? Then regulating air quality through ozone filtering by trees and then securing fresh water supplies. So Texas is in a 12-year drought, and all of the water supply for this plant comes from a, a river that's draining really really um, arid lands. So those were the big questions from Dow, um, really different from the water funds, really different from Belize. And I'll give you one more company example. And this is Unilever. So probably if you open your medicine cabinet tonight, most things in there um, Unilever produces. They're just one of these big multi-multi conglomerates. The great thing is they just bought Ben and Jerry, so they're, they're moving up in the world on my book. So what Unilever is interested in is much more supply chain global questions. So they want to know where are the safest sourcing regions to minimize harm to ecosystems. So sourcing for dairy, for Ben and Jerry's, for tea, for Lipton, which they that Lipton tea represents 12% of the tea produced in the world. 
and that's owned by Unilever. So it's really important when they make a decision about where they're going to source their tea from, it drives a lot of agricultural intensification or extensification. So we're working with them to look at some of these supply chain questions. They also want to know how can natural capital protect their water infrastructure investments? So that's a lot like the water fund question is, how can I secure clean water supply and the water recharge that I need in certain areas where I'm processing my cosmetics, et cetera? So that's a, a sampling of what we're doing with Unilever. And then I think this is the last example is the United States Department of Defense is really interested in these questions. So they came to us and wanted to look at how to do ecological forestry for many benefits. So they now in the US government have this multiple objective framework. So they use their, they have, you know, you guys probably know, well, you have BLM land out here, and many of the federal lands are in beautiful places, and many of them have really incredibly intact habitats that are very important for species. They also generate timber revenues off of their lands. They use their, their land in a new ecosystem service that I had never thought of before, which is that they need realistic habitats to train their infantry. And if they don't have the right jungle or desert or whatever they're looking for, that's a big problem for them. They also have to have things that impact the areas, like dropping bombs and running takes over it. So they want to know where can they have this very heavy training activity going on with their bulldozers and tanks? And where can some of these other benefits be balanced? So this just shows some different scenarios that we've been examining for them. HB is high budget, LB is low budget, and then IT is um, in, um, in intensive training or decreased training. So the main question that they were asking us here is, you know, they, they, they decommissioned a number of military bases around the United States as a time and um, ma mainly um, funding saver. So now they have these really big demands on infantry training capacity around the US and they want to know, can I achieve it under different budget um, designs? And what, what do I lose in these other objectives that I have for my base? So the, the, the answer here is one they're not that excited about, which is that you need more money to get all of your objectives, but the green, the high budget scenario actually with a little bit of decreased training can allow them to achieve all of their objectives. But this basically just shows lots of trade-offs and we're in the process of discussing these with them. Okay, so that, that was my last example. I, I just wanna come back to this notion that if, if anyone in this room is interacting with nature and cares about it, you might think differently and especially if you're one of our NGO partners about how you engage people in talking about why nature is important. And sometimes people get all riled up because they hate to see the negative impacts that, we're, that people's activities are having on it. That's what's spurned the whole environmental movement over the last um, 40 years. But these other arguments about how do we change the way we work our lands or fish our oceans, or how does nature actually benefit us, that might open up other ways of discussing nature conservation that we haven't thought of before. So tomorrow I'll talk more about this, but there's a lot of science that is very rudimentary that it'll be great if there's more inter interaction and infusion of the incredibly interesting science that you're all doing into these problems. So if you're interested in, in doing more of that, I've got lots of questions that need answering and we, we would love to collaborate with you. Um, and I just wanted to come back to, <laughs> to Lincoln here. Um, this, this explosion of technology is really, really going to open this up to lots of different kinds of people. And there's a lot of monitoring going on in developing countries where we work around the world that's literally just cell phones. So there's going to be a lot more rapid feedback and information about how people are interacting with nature and how nature's benefits to us or things we're doing to it are changing. And I think that's really exciting. And there's some really big database ideas that I'd be happy to talk about with you if you're interested. And I'll just close here. And Nancy and I were talking about this today. 
a lot of the common elements across all these 40 places that NatCap has worked around the world with really different stakeholders, everybody has the same kind of very emotional attachment to place. That's the one common thing I see everywhere. And it's usually based in art or music or some kind of poetry like Frost talked about. I, I think that's the common thing that unites everybody and all these other things about is it dollars, is it fish landed, is it sediment eroded, are things to bring in a bigger tent, but we already have a lot of commonality in how we think about nature and, and value it. And I think that's what is really fun for me to see in places around the world, and I'm sure you guys are seeing it here too. So, so that's the end. Thank you very much. I turn, so is it this one? I don't know. Front, off, back, on, oh, all off. This one? Oh, there we go. Okay. Yes. I see the nature by the people and for the people very clearly. But when I, when I hear the great nature of the people, you, you frame them in the context of the way that people are sort of impacting or harming the nature. Mm -hmm. And another way to frame that would be more that people really are a part of nature. Nature is a part of people. I'm wondering how that thought fits into this framework here, or that was one of the ways that you thought about trying to fit this into Lincoln's? Yeah, I did, I did think about that. So to me, that's in the for the people. So the, the way that people, our nature is shaped by nature is what you're saying, basically? Well, I, I think so, of that. So the for the people, <clears throat> it seems to me, is a really clear link with ecosystem services. Because nature is doing stuff for mm -hmm, people. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's not quite the same as saying that people really are of nature or nature. OK, yeah, so there, yeah, you're right. There's so many different ways to slice this. So in my, in my reading of ecosystem service theory, this whole, it, it's all in the construct. It's basically a social construct that people have. So we can say that we are part of nature and that we're all together. And, to, and that's in that ecosystem service framework. So that's why I put it in the four. But you're absolutely right. We could put it in the of and then divide up the other ways. It's kind of, I'm, I'm not going to write a paper about this because of that, because there's lots of ways to slice it. But, but it doesn't really matter where we put it. I, I totally agree with your point. I think that the way our constructs, we can think of it, and some people think of it totally utilitarian ways. Other people think of nature in a much more, we are one with, with everything, sort of, you know, the more Gaia way of thinking about it. There's in this natural capital book that's edited by a number of people um, in NatCap, there's a chapter in there on the philosophical um, ways that people have conceived of nature, and the one you're talking about is in there, and it's it's really a philosophical treatment. Rolly Russell and others wrote it, and it's really interesting. It uses a lot of words I don't understand, but it's, um, it, yeah. I, I, I really take your point. I think it's a good point. It's in here. I might have put it in the wrong place. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, she's asking, is the, is the project in Belize done, and what happened with our work? <clears throat> so our, our project, what we do, this is typical of all of our projects. So we work typically two or three years with a decision-making group. In this case, it was Belizean government and all these community stakeholder groups. And at, while we're co-developing the science, we're training them in these really simple open source tools that we have so that they now have four GIS scientists with the government and the university there who can keep running the models if they want to. But the, there was a, a final decision taken on a scenario that we helped them 
hone over the, over the years. And there's actually a really interesting PNAS paper coming out on how the scenario elicitation went um, and all the model results, and I'd be happy to share that with people. So the results were that they picked a scenario that all the government ministries agreed on, and they were supposed to vote on it last year, and there's been a turnover in several cabinet ministries, so they haven't voted on it yet. So, but the, the plan, there is a, a, an approved plan by the Coastal Zone Management and Authority, which is the main government that led the planning process, but they need all the ministries to approve it before it gets implemented, and it's just hung up in politics. But that, so, but to, you know, we don't want to just leave that. And a lot of people are asking us, well, what ultimately happens? And some of these processes take years to play out, especially plans. Those are the worst, the spatial planning things. So the World Wildlife Fund was our main NGO partner there. And so they have people who live there whose job it is to make sure that plan gets approved, or that's what, what they, they hope to achieve. So they'll be there through the thick and thin of all the ups and downs of the politics, and hopefully it will get approved. But from our science capacity side, we stuck with them until the plan was completed and then trained them so that if they want to look at different scenarios in the future and they get new data, they can keep doing that. So that was sort of our, our exit point, yeah. But we're watching and hoping that it does get approved. Yeah. I had a question about your framework. And it seems like the point you mentioned about climate change and how the forest is so affected by industrial action somewhere else. Does your framework have a mechanism of transferring that ownership back or, or oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, that's a very good question. Yeah, and I was talking about this with Chris today. I don't know if he's still in here, but yeah, this is a really important part of ecosystem service theory is to identify the winners and the losers and try to make them whole. So, of course, there's a big policy and usually regulatory question in there, but in, in all these cases, in order to do these models, you have to identify to whom are the services flowing. So if it's water, it's usually downstream users and that's pretty easy. For carbon, it's the globe if it's a carbon sequestration benefit. But other ones like these non-timber forest products, for example, like bush meat that some people will gather, you have to really be careful and say, who is getting those now, those benefits? And if you change that forest, who is then getting them? And how does that change who gets the benefits? And the wetland water filtration example in the US, and I bet in Australia or other parts, are really great examples of how the, the benefit, people used to get benefits of filtering water from wetlands, and then the wetland gets developed, and they create a new wetland somewhere else, and those people are still losers in that original place. And that's, there's been no way until now to actually account for that, so these methods do keep track of that, and that's how you value the change in the wetland filtration, for example. But you, well, so but then someone has to do something with that information, that's the hard part. But, but at least you can make it very transparent and say that this group of people used to get that water filtration benefit or that bushmeat benefit, and now they don't anymore, and you haven't accounted for that, and so what are you gonna do about it is sort of the science answer, yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. You, you gave that example about uh, a person having a window and seeing nature and then seeing a brick wall and then also seeing a picture of nature uh, on a computer screen. I'm wondering how realistic that computer screen was. In other words, if you yeah. made that computer screen, like Hi. for a person as a solution to really appreciate nature, yeah. if you gave the sound and you gave movement, not just a static picture, uh, you couldn't get the smell, but I'm wondering how that would, you know, there would be positive effects and that people would appreciate yeah. it, but would it show a different uh, outcome? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I always laugh at when I when I show that because that was a 2007, I think, study. So those plasma screens, you know, that was published in 2007. So it's probably a really old technology. So what if you use high def <laughs> Blu-ray with sound? Yeah, I think that's a great great new study. Yeah, I I, I don't maybe someone's done it actually. I mean, because I think 
it does seem intuitively that there would be some intermediate, not just brick wall equals plasma screen, but that was just what that study found, yeah. Yeah, uh-huh. Yeah, that's a great question, and that, that's, it's really diverse. So in some cases, like for, you know, North American climate scenarios, we have them up the wazoo, so no problem. Um, for other cases, like if you're in a developing country and you want to know what are some alternative ways that you want to access your subsistence fishery, then they're literally drawing on a map, and then we're taking pictures and digitizing it in the old days, or we now have a new tool that people can draw on a tablet and it goes into our models. So it's everything in between. So in some places they have spatially explicit development plans that they can just give us as shape files and we use those. They say these are the ones we fought over so model those. But in other cases we're developing them with the stakeholders as we go and especially the um, the sacred sites and the cultural values typically aren't already mapped, and so they really want to spend time mapping those. So it's, it's really a mixed bag. Yeah. This um, Belize PNAS paper I'll share with whoever's interested. They, that was, scenarios are in many ways not very satisfying because they're kind of little snapshot alternatives, and what this group did in Belize was really interesting, sort of a a dynamic way to change the scenarios as the model results came in and they used it in an interactive way with the communities to come up with what they liked instead of having scorched earth and conservation and something in between that nobody ever knows how to define. So it was kind of an interesting way around the, what, what I hate about scenarios. So I'd be happy to share that paper too. <laughs>